And so let's kick off this session with some Torah from Judea. He's going to really lay the groundwork for this entire session. And so Arya Bramowitz is here to bring the living Torah into our lives, making sure we go into the week with the power and light of Shabbat that we just experienced, that it should just kind of start off our Sundays and Mondays with that energy, with that mindset, with the lessons that we've learned. So Ari, thank you for consistently preparing and delivering such beautiful ideas for us every week. Everyone, here you go. Ari Abramo. Shalom, my friends. The responses I received from my testimony last week regarding the journey and the relationship I have with Shabbat has been overwhelming, and I want to thank you. And thank you also for your patience, as I have not yet had the opportunity to respond thoughtfully to each and every one of you as I plan to do. Now, towards the end of last week's Torah portion, we left with a beautiful verse which has remained true throughout the generations. The Lord did not set his affections on you and choose you because you are more numerous than the other people, for you are the fewest of all peoples. 3,000 years ago, the Jews and Chinese had approximately the same population. Yet today, the Jews are smaller than the statistical error of the Chinese population, which is about 1 billion, 100 million, give or take 48 million. And by most accounts, there are approximately 15 to 16 million Jews in the world. But why? Why do we need to be the fewest of all peoples? And to expand that question, why is it that in all of the greatest and most celebrated battles of Jewish history, the nation of Israel is overwhelmingly outnumbered and outweaponed? From the conquest of the land in which the newly liberated slaves overcame numerous armies much larger in size and in military prowess, to the story of Hanukkah in which a militia of ragtag Judean priests overthrew the Greek Seleucid Empire, to the Six-Day War, or we've spoken about before that's not even studied in West Point Military Academy. And the reason that's given is because they don't even consider it a war. They consider it a miracle. We have always been the few against the many. Now in this week's Torah portion, Ekev, the third in the book of Deuteronomy, we see Moses continuing his addressing of the nation of Israel before their entry into the promised land. And he describes in detail the abundant blessings that Hashem will pour down upon the people when they enter the land of Israel. But he tempers it with a warning. He says, you shall say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand has gotten me this wealth. Th that sentiment this will turn out to be one of the greatest stumbling blocks for the Jewish people throughout all of history, plaguing us until this very day. Now, one could say it's understandable that getting haughty and attributing your successes to yourself is just human nature, but not for the Jewish people. For us to attribute our supernatural success to natural causes, to our own strength, is simply arrogance of the highest order. Nonetheless, out of all the great challenges that the land of Israel presents us with, this challenge is the greatest. This principle, however, doesn't only manifest itself in war, but in any success we have in the Holy Land. How did the Jews eat for 40 years in the wilderness of the desert? The Torah tells us, and you shall remember the entire way in which Hashem led you these 40 years in the desert in order to afflict you and test to know what's in your heart. He then fed you manna in order that you know that man does not live by bread alone. But by the utterance of God's mouth does man live. Throughout 40 years in the desert, there, could, could, there couldn't be any confusion. Our sustenance came directly from the mouth of God through clear, irrefutable divine providence outside the natural order. And now that the nation's about to enter the land, Moses is reminding the nation that in truth, nothing's changing. While it may not be as obvious to, to, to the human eye, the source of our livelihood, our blessing, our sustenance flows from the utterance of God's mouth, not from our own efforts. And this truth is revealed in the prayer that Jews have been saying for millennia before eating bread. We say, Baruch Hashem, blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the land. Now, while it may seem pretty straightforward, a deeper look reveals the depth of this truth. There's a process of bread making. The rain comes from the heavens, not to see God's hand there, it's clear, I mean, that's what we pray for, rain from the heavens. The grain grows from the seed and blossoms into full wheat, only with God's blessing. But taking the wheat and transforming it into bread, well, that's the part that we do. 
If actually bringing forth the bread from the land is the part that we do, then why is that the part we're thanking God for in the blessing? And the answer is in the question itself, because that is the most important and challenging part to remember, that God is doing what it appears that we are doing, because it is so easy to see our hands making bread and believe that we're making it without God's help. When in truth, God is not only making the rain fall and making the wheat grow, but he's making the bread too. He's partnering with us by making it through our hands. And without him, we would not have any success even in the making of bread itself. During the last Gaza war, Jeremy and I, we were called up and uh, we were on a ground patrol around the Gaza periphery. And Jeremy hurt his leg pretty badly. We carried him back to the base. And because of uh, shortness of army vehicles, they allowed me to drive him to the hospital in Beersheba. After checking him in, I stepped outside for a breath of fresh, fresh air and a sigh of relief, and almost immediately the siren went off indicating that there were incoming missiles. So I looked up into the sky and saw three missiles right over my head. Everyone was running for cover, but for some reason I lacked that instinct and stayed outside watching the missiles right overhead, and then it was as, as if watching the finger of God popping them out of the sky. It was like pop, pop, pop. They just evaporated. They disappeared in the air. It was the Iron Dome, of course, that new technology that had been developed and perfected in that very year, which could intercept missiles with remarkable pre precision. And I was awestruck at what I had just saw. I remember it was a Friday afternoon. I went back to the base just in time to shower and prepare for Shabbat. And as Shabbat came in, the whole unit came together to welcome the Sabbath, recite the Kiddush, and eat the festive meal. And as we were eating, I stood up to share with my fellow soldiers what I had seen that day. I told them how I took Jeremy to the hospital and stepped outside just in time to see Hashem's hand pop the missiles right out of the sky. And now I heard some of them murmuring, and one of my fellow soldiers called out, You know, Ari, that was the Kipat Barzel, which in Hebrew is the Iron Dome. And some of the people laughed. And I told them, of course, I knew that was the Iron Dome. But who gave us the knowledge and the wisdom to perfect this technology? And right in time for the war, which, in which more missiles were launched and being fired into Israel than ever before. Of course these missiles were intercepted by Hashem through the Iron Dome. He alone protects us. He is our Iron Dome. The famous story about the Six Day War, miraculous war. The paratroopers had just conquered the city, old city of Jerusalem, parachuting under sniper fire. They were national heroes. And then there was a big parade for them in one of Israel's national parks in which they were celebrated. And the famous story goes that a significant number of them broke legs and sustained injuries parachuting into the ceremony where they emerged unscathed from the war itself. This, my friends, is the greatest challenge of Israel. This is the reason why we must always be so few in number, because our very existence is a testimony to the truth that Zechariah, Zechariah proclaimed. Lo b'chayil v'lo b'koach ki im beruchi amar Hashem tzvaot. It's not by might or by valor, but by my spirit, says Hashem, the Lord of hosts. Even for us here at the Arugot Farms at the Judean frontier, it's true. When we came out here, it was empty and desolate, and people call us pioneers. But for me personally, it doesn't feel true because that would be like saying the bread comes from our hands. In this week's Haftorah, the portion from the prophets that we read, Isaiah speaks about our times in chapter 51. Ki nicham Hashem tzion, nicham kol chorvoteha, for Hashem shall comfort Zion. He will comfort her ruins. He shall make her deserts like Eden and her wastelands like a garden of Hashem. Joy and gladness shall be found there thanksgiving and the sound of music. It doesn't say Jeremy and Ari will make her deserts into gardens. It says Hashem will do so. Hashem, Abba, thank you for returning us to your desolate deserts and through our hands transforming her to a garden of Eden, to the garden of Hashem. Please, Hashem, protect, protect us from arrogance and protect us from the illusion that we did all of this by the might of our hands. Remember, help us remember, Hashem, in our hearts and in our minds that it wasn't our strength and, the, and our power that has brought this redemptive beauty to the world, but your kindness and your compassion. Give us strength, Hashem, in the days to come when the nations turn against us and we stand alone to remember that you are with us and, and strengthen our hearts to put our hope and our faith in you and no one else. Shalom, my friends. Back to you, Jeremy. Thank you very much, Ari.